Thanks for having me here. Thanks, Ruchi and, and Joe and Yang for helping organize this whole thing. I think uh, this space is awesome, and I uh, hope they be able to be part of this someday. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about AI and security. So these are two huge buzzwords that I think uh, if you've gone to any tech conference or security conference, you'll be seeing all the vendors talking about how they're using the most cutting edge machine learning and AI to do predictive machine learning to help with your organization security. Um, but today what I want to cover is uh, a little bit more, if the font is a little bit small, let me know, I probably can change the size. There'll be a little bit of code later, so maybe uh, it'll be too small, but I'll try to explain everything on the slides as well as, well as I can. Um, I want to go into a little bit of the intersection of AI and security. I think this is an interesting intersection that's been starting to gain a lot of, of, of attention in the past few years. Um, there are some interesting points uh, of, 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 uh, of interest here. I, I think uh, people who are in the security industry don't generally have a strong statistics background. And people who are in other verticals in, in computer science or tech don't necessarily have a good understanding of what information security is or how to get better at, at uh, security, be it network security or application security or product security. So I think uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff that uh, we can talk about here. Um, why, why are you here? I think uh, I'm, I'm Clarence. I, uh, to the security people, I'm the AI guy. To the AI people, I'm the security guy. To people who know about both things, I'm just, I'm just a guy. But, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I was uh, kind of working in this, in this area for the past uh, three years. I did AI in school. Um, I started working in this company doing security. Um, and then I just got really interested in, it, uh, in, in my free time and just started looking at adversarial uh, methods uh, a couple years ago. And then I uh, started talking about it to the security community in specific about how to approach machine learning and artificial intelligence as a security person. I think uh, a lot of people in whichever vertical you are in, agriculture, security, you know, um, wh whatever vertical you're in in tech, AI is starting to take over. Uh, and it's starting to become a bigger and bigger thing. So I um, started writing this book uh, early this year, and um, my co-author is at LinkedIn going to Facebook. But uh, this is basically a defensive-focused book that will be uh, targeted at security engineers or uh, ML people who are looking at how they can make use of uh, ML and AI in their uh, in security use cases. So hopefully it will be worth the thousand hours of work that I've spent in front of Google Drive. But <laughs> I also run a meetup in the Bay Area. We meet at like once every two months, maybe less frequently if, if I'm really procrastinating. But it's called Data Mining for Cybersecurity. Uh, so it started just like me thinking about like why there isn't such a group. And then I just started it on meetup.com, paid the $89 fee. I don't know why they charge so much. I could probably have hosted it on Google Groups. But I still pay the fee every six months now. And um, it's now 2,000 people, so we meet every, every six months. Um, oh, we meet every two months. We just had a meetup last week, uh, and we talk about interesting stuff that's happening in the, in the industry. Different startups or large companies come to present about how they're using data science and security. So we had Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Netflix come present before. Uh, I spoke at DEF CON last year, also this year. Uh, DEF CON is amazing. I, I we talk about it sometime. It was crazy this year, and I'm on the program committee for a very interesting and niche area called AI Sec. Uh, it's co-located co with CCS this year in Texas. Uh, the deadline for submission is actually tomorrow. So if, <laughs> if you have, if you have anything interesting in this area, definitely do submit. Um, okay, so what's InfoSec? I think a lot of people who are not familiar with this uh, think of InfoSec as, as this weird niche in security. Um, I think for security people here, I, I, don't, I don't need to talk more, but this is how the United States defines InfoSec. It's basically a parent umbrella class of security that covers everything that, that has to do with security in tech. Basically anything that um, helps to prevent unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, inspection, recording, or destruction of information, which is anything you can do with information. So any kind of security, any, any, any threat to an organization or to an individual that has to do with 
stealing, breaching, or misusing any kind of information, I think is covered under InfoSec. And this is a typical attack path. I think it's always useful to start with something like that because, um, because this is how InfoSec relates to our life. This is how it can affect you as a person or your company as an organization. Typically, it starts with the user. And, and that's why I think any security situation when you're, trying to, when you're trying to trace down where the root cause of the problem is, it's more likely than not lie, lying between the keyboard and the monitor. Uh, so it's, <laughs> so I, I think that's always the largest attack factor. Um, people target users, compromise systems, they install Trojans on your machines, backdoors, viruses, malware, and then uh, they get they use this this uh, this uh, this entrance point and then do horizontal pivoting in your network and end up stealing tons of data. Lots of the largest breaches in in recent years, Target breach, LinkedIn breach. I think they're all they're, they're all similar in, in in this way. They're all like point of sale breaches. They're all things that uh, people don't usually pay much attention to, ending up causing a huge breach because they're linked to other parts of the network that are more secure and uh, are under much more scrutiny. So security is typically done in a very static way. It's kind of a field that's been stagnant for 20 years, 30 years. Uh, ever since computers were a thing, um, well, this is what I've, I've heard from, from, from the old guys. I, I think uh, security has always been about signature matching, and, and for a good reason, because of the consequences of having a false positive, of the consequences of doing something wrong. Typically, when you wrongly block someone or, or deny them access to a system, the cost of them regaining this, this, this access is, is high. It typically involves human effort. It typically involves a special action, typically involves cost in human resources that has to be dedicated to correcting this error. And a lot of security is done by heuristics, heuristics defined by experts, so people who know about the problem, who are, who are domain experts in a particular space, I feel like make a lot of decisions about what is allowed and what is not. And the way I'm describing it, what is allowed and what is not, is also very binary. So the way of, the way of security till today, I feel, has been very binary. When you disallow someone from doing something, you completely disallow that, that someone and completely block him out. Uh, when you allow something, then you give him complete access. Obviously, there, there, there are some exceptions there, but that's been the general modulus operandi of, of, of security till today. And the final decisions are made by a human sitting in front of a computer. Security operation centers are a huge operation, a huge industry, and uh, for, for, for a good reason, because humans still make better decisions than a lot of machine algorithms today. Um, SOC centers typically operate 24-hour shifts. They, they are co-located around the world, so when the New York office goes to sleep, then the, the India office starts up and takes over. And lots of security services, even companies that specialize in security, make use of security operation centers to really monitor graphs, do things that are really boring, and occasionally you'll see a spike and then go investigate it, and then you realize that, oh, it's just a server going down, nothing crazy. But that's how security is done today. So I'm gonna look at a few examples of how security was done, and we can see like how this is problematic, right? So antivirus in the 1990s to 2010s uh, used to be like this. This is an open source version of a very popular antivirus library. It's called Yara. It's just a pattern matching library, pretty much. So the basic idea is you're taking a hash of a binary, and then you're doing a match of hashes, right? So so this is an example uh, of a PHP web shell, and you see the hash here, and you're looking for certain strings that exist in, 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 the, in, in the binary, and then you're trying to see if this binary matches to, this binary matches any rules that you predefine. Uh, there's a Git page here with uh, lots of rules that people have defined over the years, and it's really um, pretty non-exhaustive and easy to bypass way of doing things, but that's, that's pretty much how antivirus was done. So obviously there are many ways of bypassing these things. I'll go over a few. Um, is it too small? It's a bit too small? Okay. I'll just talk about it. Okay, so um, there's this thing called metamorphic malware, which is the logical thing to do if you wanted to distribute malware and you're making five, six times the median income of people around you by distributing malware and stealing people's passwords to your bank accounts. So you would do everything you can to secure 
to secure your income, right? Because your income depends on your binaries being distributed to many people and you not being blocked by Norton antivirus. So what you would do would be to do all sorts of things to the binary to make it have the same effect or a better effect, but have a different hash or have a different or not match the signatures that, that's out there and, and it's been carefully crafted by all the security engineers out there. So things like inserting dead instructions, like move EDX, and you have a move EDX right before, and it's actually an instruction that exists but doesn't really do anything, would cause a different hash in, in, some, in some cases of, of, of uh, like some, some dumber hash, hash uh, functions. Um, inserting no ops, unreachable code, just in, inserting a jump here and then having some, some, some junk code, but not actually having executed that code at all. Um, just things like that. I, I probably won't go through all of them because it's too small. But things like that are pretty easy and trivial ways to bypass rule engines and static, an static analysis engines that, use, uh, that, that are used by all these antivirus companies to uh, identify malware. Similarly, in the, in the web application space and endpoint detection engine space, uh, if, you, if you had a web server and, and you're trying to detect when someone is trying to DDoS you and we're trying to detect that someone's trying to do something crazy, then a very simple thing you can do is just to do rate limiting on IP address. But then, uh, obviously, if you're an attacker and you're trying to, to make a large number of requests, maybe you're trying to scrape the site or something, then you would just get a proxy, get, get a bunch of different IP addresses and, and do, do this. It's pretty easy to, to find out the static tr thresholds that are set and then just fly below that, right? Because I think maybe anyone who has, who has tried to scrape GitHub or tried to scrape Yelp has probably done the same thing. Um, OS Query is, is, is from Facebook, and it's basically like a SQL interface to, uh, a unified SQL interface to your operating system and, and, and low-level details about uh, what's running in your system, for example. So a very common query that people use to look for binaries or look for suspicious uh, binaries that are running is to look for running processes whose binary has been deleted from disk, because that's a typical thing that viruses do. But uh, obviously, there are a lot of malware that start becoming fileless, they start existing in registry, start existing purely in memory, and then this would you know, trivially bypass that. These are some examples of, of uh, data sets that web application firewalls would use. They would just do string matching on things like this. So if you see like, you do a dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, that's when they try to escape uh, when they try to es escape the, the, the web server sandbox and, and they try to find, try to access the Etsy password file. Um, it's very like old school kind of way of doing things. Obviously, like you can think, you can just feed this into an algorithm and try to figure out like um, when someone is doing something similar to this and changing a single character or encoding it in Unicode and then having it execute um, in your web browser wouldn't be caught by wouldn't be caught by uh, some some static matcher like that, but would be would maybe be caught by uh, a more fuzzy matching library. So that's just a, an, an example of how things are done today. Um, so we we'll look at how attackers are attackers have have used uh, some interesting techniques to bypass uh, static matching. Domain generation algorithms are an interesting concept. I I, I think. That, um, that people have, have put a lot of time and effort into in research, in, in academia, and in, 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 in industry to really try to detect malware. And why, why is generating, generating a domain name interesting? So imagine like you wrote, a, you, you wrote a, a piece of malware and you wanted it to be distributed across, uh, around the world. And this, mal this piece of malware is only, is only doing meaningful work if it can send you information so for example, an interesting piece of malware called, called FruitFly, which is targeting OSX and has, uh, and has been distributed, I think, at least 200,000 times around the world and was analyzed recently at DEF CON two, two weeks ago by Patrick Wardle at Synac, was a binary that existed in your OS temp folder that if a CNC server, a command and control server, sent it single letter commands, it would, for example, be able to take screenshots of your screen, obviously low resolution screenshots, and send it back to a command and control server, or move your mouse to a certain XY coordinate on your screen. So if you see your mouse moving and you're not there, I should probably check your temp folder. Uh, so 
that, that's how a lot of malware operates, but the, the, the crux of that is that there needs to be a command and control, that there needs to be a master, if it's a botnet that's using your compute resources to do some crazy thing or to, 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 uh, to click on ads fraudulently, then there always needs to be a central server or multiple central servers around the world to send this piece of malware commands. And how would you make your binary uh, reach, how, how, how would you uh, let your binary reach this server? Uh, you can use an IP address, but then if all binaries are making a request to this single IP address, then it's actually pretty trivial to block this. So what people do is they end up using DNS as a service and they load balance between different IP addresses. And when you're making a DNS request to a particular URL, then um, then obviously it's, it, it's also pretty, pretty uh, suspicious if, if you see a, a weird DNS request to, to a weird string. A lot of security companies started looking at uh, DNS requests that were made to, to strange looking strings. And so domain generation algorithms are ways to generate domain names uh, that basically look as real as possible or look as legitimate as possible so that the defenders can't necessarily detect when this DNS request is strange because that was a huge way that malware was being defeated in the, in the late 90s. So here are just some topologies of, of uh, botnets that I think are really interesting. The, the, ways, the ways that botnets have evolved over time, I feel like it's a, it's a big study in, res, in like computer system resiliency and how to develop uh, really fault-tolerant systems because um, the way that the malware community has been thinking or the botnet authors have been thinking is just uh, Pretty interesting. So they used to start with a single CNC server and then you, develop, you distribute a bunch of, of binaries, but then if, let's say, this one server goes down, then obviously all your, all your effort in distributing these binaries is, is down the drain, right? But they started going with a hierarchical topology. So basically, your binaries can be some other binaries, uh, a CNC server, and you're basically propagating commands down. Then it just started going through multiple topologies, and in the end, Today, most, most malware, most botnet malware is actually P2P, so it's totally, totally uh, masterless, and, and that's like the most resilient way of actually distributing a piece of malware and having commands propagated across the network. Um, so there's some interesting stuff. Like I, I wrote a lot about this in, in, the, in the book. Um, these are some examples of, of um, domains, of, of, of DNS, uh, of, of domain names. Like CryptoLocker is, was big recently, and they had a pretty sophisticated DN, uh, domain name generator inside the binary itself. Similar for, for, for Mirai, Mirai had, had, um, had a way for the binary itself to generate domain names, uh, to, to, to generate uh, DNS names. And then there's also like, this is also being done in, in detection, obviously, because you want to be able to, gener to, to detect when a domain name is potentially suspicious or not. I won't go too much into detail about that. We can chat later if you're interested. So how this relates to industry, I, there's this big security conference called RSA in, in, in San Francisco um, every February. And I go there every year because the Expo Pass is free. But just like walking around, like talking to different companies, it's a bit mind boggling sometimes. What, what I started to do last year was to look at the, was basically to scrape the RSA website over the years and then get company descriptions. And I basically like looked at how, how companies are describing themselves so if you look at the number of companies using terms like machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, big data, adaptive to describe their, their company, it's basically been exponentially increasing over the past few years. I, I didn't add the 2017 one. It's actually, it's actually gone down, I think, maybe because it's, uh, you know, people think that it's, it's too much of a buzzword and actually using it too uh, distastefully is, 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 a, is a good way to put people off. But um, I think this, this shows a trend. There are security companies that publish uh, papers, and, and Carbon Black is a pretty interesting company. If you've been following on Twitter or, or the news, they are a AI-driven antivirus solution. Uh, a lot of penetration testers that I've talked to actually stand behind Carbon Black's solution. They say that uh, other solutions, it's kind of hard to, to bypass. If you have a zero day or if you have a vulnerability that has been un, unreleased, if you try it on, on Carbon Black, uh, more likely than not, it's, it's going to find it anyway. Um, but they, they, publish, they themselves publish stuff that a lot of security uh, researchers say that it's kind of trivial to bypass AI security solutions. A lot of the ways that people integrate AI into security products are done in a very, not very, like they're, they're done in a relatively uninformed way and 
it's a lot of the time much easier to just fall back onto heuristics rather than use the core AI component that mainly the marketing team uses to really do the, 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 the action that it's meant to do. Um, ML and security industry, I think there's a huge landscape here. Uh, the fraud space has always been in front of security because money is involved, because banks are involved. So it's been, I think, five to 10 years ahead of the security industry in, in, in adopting new and effective technologies. So companies like PayPal, Stripe, um, they're, they're doing really good work in detecting when someone is making transactions on your credit card or your online payment account uh, in a weird way. So they're, like the, olden, the olden methods of detecting fraud when you make a small purchase at a gas station and then make a huge purchase and then you get a notification, I think it's no longer the case in a lot of places. Um, they, they obviously develop personalized models to how your spending habits are and then they try to determine if this new purchase that's being made is done by you or, or it's not and it's the confidence score and, and everything. I think that, that's all great. But the malware endpoint space, basically trying to detect when you are being infected by a piece of malware or a, p a binary is actually, a, is actually malicious or not, that's actually non-trivial because even for a human expert, it may take hours to days to weeks to determine if something's malicious or not. Like what is even the meaning of malicious, I think is, is highly contentious. If something is just adware, let's say it's making use of your compute resources to click on some ads, maybe it's harmful to an external party, maybe it's harmful to the people paying for the ads, but it doesn't really cause you any damage, so is that really malicious? I think it's, it's uh, debatable. Um, but there's also lots of, lots of other stuff in, in, in the area. Authentication is, is, is a big one. When you're using uh, some kind of data science to determine if the person making the request or the person trying to gain access or the person logging into an account is actually who they claim they are or someone that's uh, you know, got stolen credentials and then trying to log in, that's a big space. Um, IoT, mobile, web security is also hugely affected by this. So why ML and security? I think we've seen that syntactic uh, signature matching fails pretty tragically when uh, you're dealing with adaptive adversaries, right? The thing about security is that you're always developing a solution that someone can instantly respond to and instantly react to. Unlike, uh, develop, unlike using AI in NLP or, or using AI in a few other fields, I think um, it's very challenging to use it in a field where the thing you're trying to classify is actively trying not to be classified. <laughs> so I think there's a fundamental incompatibility there. And obviously it doesn't apply, this generalization doesn't apply to all of security, it doesn't apply to just security. But I think that's an important thing that I've been thinking about, and a lot of people in the security industry have been thinking about as well, and it's been really hard to reconcile using artificial intelligence in security just because of this, this concept. Also, in recent years, there's been a lot of data being collected, and that's why AI is, is, is becoming a huge thing, I, I think. But systems also, also glow, grow pretty complex quickly, and as systems grow more and more complex, there's gonna be more and more bug, cl bug classes. I think when you add a thousand lines of code, it's gonna add many, many more potential vulnerabilities to, to a piece of, to a, piece, to a program. And it's gradually ex exceeding manual analytical capabilities. So if you used to have a QA person who would be looking at uh, how a code could break, how a, piece, how a piece of code could break, when, you, when this piece of code expands in, in complexity, then there's gonna be so many more possible ways that this piece of code could break, so many more dependencies that could cause this to, to fail. And the thing is that ML exceeds, uh, ML excels at pattern matching, ML ex excels at looking for certain ways that pieces of information appear in order to match a certain, um, a certain function. It, it, it excels at anomaly detection, it, it excels at information mining in, in some spaces. So I think this is why uh, the security community has been trying so hard to pursue this fundamentally incompatible um, area. Um, but what makes it so difficult? I think there are four main points. There's a high cost of errors, as we've seen, which is, I think, a driving reason as to why the security industry has stuck with rules even till today. Um, when you make a mistake, it's usually going to cause a chain reaction that is gonna cause a lot of cost on human resource and, and human time to an organization. Lack of training data, 
Um, for example, if you're classifying images, you can put something on Mechanical Turk and get a bunch of random people to just see if this is a cat or a dog. But if you have a binary, you can't really do that uh, because you're not going to be able to get that, that labeled data easily. Um, importance of explainability is an interesting thing. I think a lot of this has to do with cultural reasons. Um, the way that humans gain access to computer systems, I feel like it's kind of in a sacred area. And if you deny someone access to his Facebook account or his LinkedIn account, um, he's going to react more violently than, <laughs> than, than if you make the wrong decision in, in some other area. For example, if you make the wrong recommendation on Netflix, I'll just ignore it. If you, make me, if you accidentally log me out of my account because you think that I'm not who I claim I am, I'll be like, this sucks. I'm going to watch videos on some other service instead. Um, also, what's been really hot over the past couple of years have been inherent vulnerabilities in, in AI itself. And so I think there's a prerequisite for using security in, in artificial intelligence. Sorry, the other way around. The prerequisite for using artificial intelligence in security is that this technology has to be fundamentally non-malleable, right? So if someone is trying to actively um, someone is trying to actively work against this system and trying to actively change how the system makes decisions, then that's problematic because you're dealing with ad adaptive adversaries that are trying to make, uh, give the system input or change the system in, in a way that uh, benefits themselves. So for example, if I had a, if I had a uh, machine learning WAF that was uh, taking in a real-time input from the users, I don't know why you would do that, but let's say it, it, you were, you were uh, dealing with a system that did that, then you would basically send in a bunch of input that will poison the model to think that more and more abnormal looking events that you're passing in are actually normal. And then eventually you'll maybe expand the, the decision boundary of, 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 this, of this decision engine and eventually let your, let your attack, attack through. So this thing, is, this thing is called the red herring attack or model poisoning. I think uh, this is stuff that I did a couple of years ago when I was initially looking at it. I looked at some open source versions of web application firewalls, and then started looking at how they made decisions and how they compared to just static rule engines, right? If you have the rate limit, if you have the rate limiter, um, and if you had one of these, how they how they reacted to different kinds of input differently. I realized that it's pretty trivial. Actually, it, 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 there's a really dumb way of just bypassing these these systems. Um, for example, if you wanted to like send in a if you wanted this system to detect cross-site scripting um, and think about the kinds of, uh, of, of input they would take in, it's basically stuff that other people have uh, used for cross-site scripting before. An example, so you would have like a script tag and then alert one, close script tag. And then I, tr I realized that if you did like script tag, alert two, or alert hello, then a lot of the time it, these systems wouldn't catch it, which is kind of dumb if you think about it because the content of inside the script tag is not important, but then it kind of uh, is really affected by the context in which you tokenize these strings and you feed them in, into algorithms. And peop only people with domain knowledge or only an algorithm which really understands what this code does um, will, is really able to deal with this. Um, I started doing stuff in, in WAF. I started using what the, the best stuff I could find in papers, like robust methods, for example, using medians instead of means, like median absolute deviation to, to do PCA. I still found that there was like a 40% chance of being able to bypass these systems after a, a longer training period. Now, I won't go too much into detail. Like there's some talks online uh, I can point you to or we can talk about it later. But this was not working too well. Um, and so I think the two main classes of attacks on, on, on machine learning models are model poisoning and adversarial examples. So I think man manifold attacks, which is what I think is, a, is, is an apt name for it, uh, this is stuff that's, I think it's like a bit like overscan, but the the citation is here. So I think it's done by Nicholas Papernot, who spoke at my meetup a couple of months ago. Um, but basically, they found that uh, they could attack black box models, basically metamine AWS and Google Cloud, and achieve a pretty good rate of misclassification. I think they used they, they did the MNIST data set on this, found that they could misclassify these with like close to 100% accuracy, just with trivial techniques that they use to generate adversarial versions of these, of these digits, which is interesting. And everyone has seen the panda becoming a gibbon by adding white noise stuff. Um, there's, I, I'm not sure if, if you guys have, have seen this um, visualization, which I think is really cool. And um, I use it in, 
and some stuff. I think it's done by the University of Virginia, and and you're basically generating an adversarial version of, of this of this digit here, this this MNIST digit. And let's say you wanted it to, to look like a like a six. Then if you generate an adversarial sample here, it'll basically generate something that in real time it'll, it'll generate a new image that just is slightly changed and the confidence, uh, the, the output vector is, is here and this six slightly triumphs over zero. And so I think things like these are really interesting. And uh, so what I did last year, uh, yeah, this is really interesting. There's a Kaggle competition on this now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about what, what I did last year a bit later, but I use similar techniques on malware classifiers and forced malware classifiers that are uh, wrapped in a black box to misclassify a certain piece of malware by adding, not random, but adding uh, some changes to binaries that would cause uh, changes in, in how these were classified by these engines. But also, of course, like AI safety leaks in the meat space as well. I've been following uh, this kind of maybe pseudo drama or what's the most dramatic thing that's been happening in this space, I think, on Twitter. It's just like people publish papers about adversarial examples in the real world and then someone else published like, you don't actually need to worry about this um, because if you just slightly uh, transform this image, uh, they, they, they showed in their paper that it doesn't matter or, or the misclassification will no longer work. And then of course, like people were unhappy about it. I think uh, there was a tweet by Ian Goodfellow. I think Ian Goodfellow has been really vocal on, on, on Twitter. Um, but basically, there was a bunch of papers published after that to show that like, this is wrong. You can actually produce adversarial samples that are robust to any kinds of transformations or different angles. And I think the more recent one, a couple of days ago, was that they found that adding some stickers to a stop sign would actually cause an image classifier to no longer recognize it as a stop sign from different angles and distances and, 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 and uh, directions, lighting conditions. So I thought that was really interesting. Like, the safety of, of AI is not the focus of my talk, but the safety of, of AI is, is um, such an important thing. And people who maybe have a, an, an understanding of artificial intelligence from the media or even just from reading stuff online or taking courses don't necessarily think about how reliable these things are. And especially in security where you're kind of depending the, the system's uptime or, or, or the system's availability depends on, so much on um, this system being uh, non-malleable to people that are actively trying to do it harm that uh, it makes a lot of sense to put a lot of thought into this before we actually deploy them in mission-critical applications. So AI used by the other side, I, I feel like uh, is particularly interesting and a lot of the people that I talk to usually are people who are offensive, right? So if you go to DEF CON, if you go to a lot of underground security conferences, uh, a lot of them are tourists, that's true, but then a lot, a lot of them are also people that, whose day job is to find bugs in things and then sell them to people with temporary email accounts. But, <laughs> and, <laughs> but that, that's, that's the truth of the matter, and they're always looking for new techniques to find bugs in things that are harder to block or are worth more money. And, uh, for example, capture solving has been an area that I think has been totally d destroyed by by um, by using image classification from from deep, lear deep learning, but also from using like mechanical Turk style system design. I think uh, death by capture is an interesting example of an online service. It's basically an API for solving captures. So if you ever need to scrape a service protected by a capture, death by capture I think allows you to solve like 0.1 cent per capture. So that's a uh, Pretty good. So obviously, different kinds of capture models like um, Facebook has. Do you recognize any of these friends? I think those are harder because there's there's con contextual knowledge involved. Um, stuff that Google Recapture has been doing, which is like identifying which which of the nine squares has uh, has a bridge in it, right? I think those are a little bit harder because they're dynamic. But it's just a matter of time, and it's just a matter of people being motivated enough to develop systems to solve these. I think. Theoretically, fundamentally, they're all solvable by machines, and you're able to scale up the solving of all of these indefinitely, right? So vulnerability scanning is, is a huge thing. We'll talk about that later, talk about the rest of the stuff later as well. So this is stuff that I did last year. I presented in a conference in China, and that was mainly like a black hat conference. So it's, it's, it's more of people who, you know, like people who make use of uh, 
bug bounty programs in the U.S. Uh, to get U.S. level salary while living in, 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 in other countries with much lower cost of living. So like, uh, I used that technique on Gmail's malware classifier. Gmail has a malware classifier here. If you try to upload a known piece of malware, no one really knows how this is implemented, I think. But if you upload a piece of malware, they'll, they'll have a virus detected here, and your attachment will not be attached. Um, so I just use like this pretty, pretty simple, like pretty uh, standard approach to uh, changing bits. And actually, I did on an instruction level in this PE file, this, this portable, ex portable executable file, and just inserted instructions into certain portions of the binary that would cause uh, this binary to be interpreted in a, in a different way. So mainly portable executable files are like exe files or anything that, be executed, anything that can be executed on a Windows machine um, in, in the past. And then I, I would insert a malicious seed into that and try to see if it, meant, if it retained its malicious behavior. For example, uh, and, and this is where I, I saw that like training data sets are really, are really limited because I had to label each one of those myself or augment the existing labels that were there because you had to really determine what functionality of this binary really caused it to be malicious. And if after changing this, it, it caused it to crash or, or it no longer uh, ran, the, ran the part of the code that actually uh, de caused it to be deemed uh, malicious, then it's, it's, not, it's not a successful uh, morphology anymore, right? So as long as it retains its malicious behavior, I will, I will keep it. And then I'll try to try it on the Gmail malware classifier by basically uploading it. Just had Apple script that would just drag and drop from Finder. And then basically what this, what this uh, resulted in was about a 50% evasion rate, which is, which is not great. But then if you're trying to distribute uh, malware to people, all you have to do is to find one binary that's not caught by this classifier and then just really send it over email to people and convince them that this is an important file that they have to open, which is easy. <laughs> now, of course, like at DEF CON this year, uh, you have to use GANs, so they use GANs to do something similar. Um, basically, it's, it's a similar idea. I think he released a code for that, which is, which is, which is great for everybody. Um, but, uh, so at DEF CON, there were two talks in the main track about adversarial networks. One was from Endgame, which is a company based in Virginia. And what, they, what, what, what this was about was basically bypassing next-gen antivirus. Next-gen just means they're using AI in some way. And then the other one was about using AI to uh, hack systems. And the definition of hack is kind of loose. Basically, they're trying to find SQL injections, or they're trying to automatically generate cross-site scripting SQL injections for web applications. Um, so I think the way that I judge how popular a particular topic is is how hard it is to get into a talk. I couldn't get into either of those talks. So, <laughs> and and I, I waited in line like before the talk started, like half, half an hour before. There's a huge line. Not sure like if you've been to DEF CON, but that's, that's the way things are. This year, there are 27,000 people packed into Caesar's Palace. And uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, I did a workshop on ML and security there. And it was sold out in like 40 seconds. But, <laughs> but that, that's the way things are. I think when something is really interesting to people that, whose livelihood depends on this, then, then they really like go all out to learn all about it. The thing about DEF CON is that the content isn't really, well, the slides are, and all are released, but the, the actual videos of talks aren't released till a few months later. So if you really want to know what's going on, then you got to like be there or you got to talk to someone who's, who was there or you got to you know, find a way to find out. And um, yeah, it's definitely becoming more and more focused in the security community because, especially because a lot of security companies are starting to see the value of using this and are starting to use this in real life. Um, and uh, yeah. Everything that you've talked about up until this moment is all about um, how security can be used to hack existing systems. Right. Oh, sorry, AI can be used to hack existing systems. You're not really talking about how AI can be part of the solution to prevent. Yeah, so I have it l later on. Um, there are some, so in, in the agenda, I have, I, have a, I have a part which is the cool ideas part, which I think are ways that you can use AI and security that are currently in the research phase or are currently in very early product stages. I think that's a, 
that's interesting and and definitely like AI can be used to hack systems, but at some point that's going to get old and people are going to find ways to defend them. The very motivated people are still going to be able to get past, but it's no different from today. So um, we'll, we'll get to that in, in about in a few minutes. Um, this is interesting. This is from last year's DEF CON. Uh, there are people who gave a talk about how they were able to do very targeted and low effort spear phishing on Twitter by just reading people's public tweets and then seeing what kind of language they should use to maximize the, the, the interaction of this human. So they targeted 10,000 DOD accounts, which is like basically people who are supposed to be good at security in our countries, like security depends on it, but uh, they got like a 45% engagement. Like people clicked on a link. It was a non-functional link, obviously, because else they'll go to jail. But um, <laughs> but this, uh, it's pretty interesting. I, I, I watch it online if, if I are you. They use a simple Markov language model and they just tried to generate uh, tweets and they had a link and you see like people tweet, these are the most mind-blowing robots according to 18, 18 artificial intelligence software and this is someone who's uh, an AI researcher or at least someone who's really active on Twitter about AI and then like, thanks but the link's, is, link's broken so that means that he or she actually tried clicking it. But this is how you target people, and spear phishing used to be a very labor-intensive thing because you had to really go and like have a human look at a profile and understand what this person likes or what this person is most likely to respond to, which takes time, right? But then, um, if you just decrease this level of effort, then you're a you're able to target a lot more people with a much higher higher rate of of, uh, of engagement. So cool ideas that are in research or doesn't or don't yet exist. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time in, in this section. Um, the first thing is program analysis, right? So everyone wants to find bugs in software, and I mentioned earlier that software bugs are exploding in, in, in you know, the number of bug classes as complexity goes up. This is Apple's bug bounty program, the citations here, but basically Apple has the craziest bug bounty program. They pay like $200,000 for um, a, a remote code execution in secure boot firmware components, which is obviously hard to do. Um, not sure, like if you follow the iOS jailbreaking community, you'll see that it's, it was worth millions of dollars. Maybe when, when I, iPhone first came out, this year at DEF CON there was a talk about hacking um, an Apple Watch, which has a much more limited scope of effects because uh, you know it's a, it's a watch, so there's less capability. But still, people jump through so many hoops if you, uh, if you look at his slides, you'll see that he actually dumped the firmware four bytes by four bytes, and <laughs> he, he, he made use of, a, of printing out a, of, of a crash um, that he was able to control to print out four bytes by four bytes of the firmware. Then after reassembling the firmware, he, he was able to find like certain, certain pieces of code and chaining together four existing vulnerabilities to cause a remote code execution that, was, that allowed him to install an SSH agent on the iOS, on the, on the Apple Watch. Then he realized that the Apple Watch only had Bluetooth, so he had to actually SSH through, through Bluetooth, which is a crazy thing. And people jump through all kinds of hoops, and basically you're jumping sandbox out of sandbox out of sandbox because security is done by sandboxing today. So I think it's, it's a good direction to, to go towards, but then if you're looking at um, how to truly secure systems, um, I think that this may be optimizing for the wrong a reward function because uh, the very motivated people will still be able to jump through sandboxes, but security researchers who are doing this just to find vulnerabilities for your good uh, may not be motivated to really jump through the hoops and jump, jump out of sandboxes to find the bugs. So the way that you'll find out that there's a jailbreak or the way that you find out there's a vulnerability is when someone actually does it for malicious reasons. But that aside, what we're looking for is a crash that leads to an exploit. So obviously, like the way people do it would be, um, okay, so a crash can be something like memory corruption or use after free integer overflows, code execution, and uh, there's some, this, this is an example of a, of a classic bug where in IE 9 to 11, if you try to create an, an element, and then if, if you try to access a piece of the, uh, a piece of, of, of JavaScript that the, the browser didn't have permissions to access, then you, you throw an error. Then once you have a crash, some crashes uh, give, the, give the, the person an ability to 
actually exploit this crash. So this was initially reported to Microsoft, and then they said that it was, it was not uh, eligible for a reward because this is a crash, but it's not exploitable. Then they, they proved them wrong by exploiting it and basically caused a remote code execution in Internet Explorer. Basically, they, they had an out-of-bound read, and then they bypassed a a ASLR. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's the way things typically go. But how to find this crash initially is, is hard. So the way that people do it is static analysis, right? Static analysis is a like, hair-pulling activity of just doing code inspection, walking through code, debugging, reverse engineering um, with things like IDA Pro. If you have like, look, looked at this, uh, like you just dump a binary into it. If you, if you dump like, simple pieces of binary that, does, that all it does is add one and two, then it's pretty easy to understand. If you dump like the Windows calculator program into it, it's mind blowing, right? So you just imagine looking for bugs in this manner in modern programs, it's crazy. So other ways that people do it are automatic ways. So there, there are some things that have demonstrated some promise. I think static verification is, is a technique that's not, not new in, in, in any measure. Um, but there's limited use in practice because it's just so computationally intensive and it just makes, uh, I mean, there's obviously successful projects like clean and, and, and stuff that, that, that work, but it's not really used in industry because for complex programs, it takes so long to run and it's so inefficient. And most programs are complex. Most programs that you want to find bugs in are complex. So symbolic concolic execution is just a way of uh, symbolizing, symbolizing inputs to programs. And then you're trying to basically solve a satisfiability uh, 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 equation, and it's, it's more popular these days because of the dramatic improvement in the efficiency of solving these equations like Z3 and, and, and all these algorithms can, can solve them pretty well and efficiently. Dynamic analysis is, is, is a way that more people use to find bugs in software. So how it typically works is that you have a binary and you know this takes an input, so you just feed it a whole bunch of input and you see what's thrown out. If you feed in some input that causes a crash, you're in luck. And, uh, but if, you, you can imagine how, how crazy this is, like it, it's just feeding a bunch of random strings, ASCII text, or binaries into a binary. And uh, this thing is called fuzzing. Um, so fuzzing is, is, uh, is an area that most penetration testers know and it's, it's near and dear to their hearts because they do it all day. It's kind of a boring job, you can imagine, but, um, how you do it is basically you identify a target, you generate the fuzz data, you, you generate a bunch of input that typically crashes programs, and then dump it into this program and, and hope that it crashes it, then you can write it in your report and they'll pay you some money, or you just crash it and then find an exploit and then you get the money yourself. But this is how people do it typically. Um, there's obviously frameworks developed around it, like this thing called American Fuzzy Lop is uh, it uses some kind of genetic algorithm, like no one really knows how it works, but it does. And uh, they generate input that is more likely to cause a program to crash. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. So obviously, like if you have a piece of code like this, uh, if you can't see it, what it is is an if condition. It's a conditional piece of code that uh, if it meets a certain specific argument, if you have a magic number here that matches this piece of code, then it'll cause a crash, right? D divide by zero, right? So if, if, you, um, if your fuzzer is able to reach this piece of code, then you'll find a bug. But how likely is it that you'll reach that single condition in all of input space? Um, so symbolic execution comes to the rescue. But again, like you're gonna be waiting forever because SMT solvers are efficient, but programs are also really complex and Complexity always wins, so uh, I won't go through this code in detail, especially because it's so small, but what this is is just an example of an SMT solver. It's a very simple, like, the slides will be available, I guess, and then you can, you can look at this. Basically, you're just adding a bunch of conditions, and then you're trying to find the password to a program. People use this a lot for key cracking in software, so if you, like, download Photoshop in old days, and then you're a key gen, so this is what, this is what's done. But, It'll just give you a, a result for the key. Um, so like this really interesting thing that, that uh, someone wrote a paper about last year was um, this thing that combined techniques for symbolic execution and fuzzing. 
basically what it does was, basically what it does is to um, fuzz a program and then it would find certain execution paths that are more promising to perform symbolic execution on and then it would then perform <coughs> symbolic execution on that subtree of, of the program. And it turned out to work really well and optimize the time for, for fuzzing a program and finding bugs um, to a huge extent. So I think um, this is a really promising area of, of, uh, that ML can, can, can come into use. Um, so this is something that I am spending a lot of my time uh, working on today. Uh, Microsoft, uh, I think earlier last month, released uh, an intelligent fuzzing as a service framework online. No one really knows how it works unless you work at Microsoft, then let's talk. But, um, <coughs> but uh, apparently a bunch of companies use it and it dramatically de decreases their time it takes to find bugs in software. I'm not sure if it's actually found any bug yet, but um, there's, there's also um, machine learning frameworks that have been used to optimize fuzzing campaigns. By fuzzing campaigns, I mean uh, every run of American Fuzzy Lop, which is that framework, in, in, which is that, that command line framework that basically uses genetic input to optimize uh, the chance that you're able to find a bug in a piece of software. And uh, it, it's using similarities in code trees that have demonstrated to be vulnerable in, vulnerable in other pieces of software to uh, to basically prioritize those first, so you're more likely to find a bug uh, faster than if you just did it in a you know democratic flat way. Um, automatic patch application is is also a very interesting area. So after you find a bug, like what do you do with it? How do you fix it? And obvi and obviously the speed at which you deal with a bug or a vulnerability matters a lot because if someone publishes a vulnerability for your application, then uh, it helps you a lot that you see it first and you fix the problem first before someone else sees it and tries to exploit the problem. Um, so there was a paper out, out of CSAIL that was basically automatic patch generation. What they did was to look at a bunch of open source projects uh, and then look at the issues and look at the way that these issues were fixed. Obviously, I imagine this must have been a really tough labeling process because how you deem a piece of code as having fixed a problem is also kind of arbitrary. Um, but what they did was basically come up with a system that I think is open source today that are able to use to generate patches fully automatically. And obviously this is just like directions for how you would use a patch so you wouldn't have to write it from scratch and a human would eventually still have to look at it to see if it makes, made sense. But it would dramatically dec decrease the time that someone could come in and fix, fix a bug in, in a piece of code um, without having to like start from scratch or or re-enter the context of what this code is doing. Still, so technography is something interesting as well. Um, so this is a really fascinating idea that was presented this year at, Def, at, at DEF CON. This, this uh, framework in particular is really useful. It was presented in POC or GTFO here. And um, what this is, is a, it's, it's a journal. It's a journal that has existed for some time um, that people publish ex exploits in and it's free online, just do check it out. There's lots of cool stuff in there. But technography is the art of hiding a message in something that, uh, some, some form that's hard for people to just tell there's a message in there. So a very common way for doing this is to do this in images. So for example, this image contains a, a Firefox buffer overflow, and the ways that browsers deal with images or how they execute it in media processing libraries are sometimes buggy and a lot of the time buggy. So you can actually cause a buffer overflow and crash Facebook just by including this image in your website if you use Firefox like 30 something. But obviously it's not that simple. Um, so P P how, how he does it was just this framework will allow you to encode images in a way that would uh, insert these bits into different encoding layers of, 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 the, J of the JPEG file, of the PNG file I think because of compression. But it's not that simple because compression, resizing, format correction, and metadata stripping happens on the internet all the time unpredictably. So um, the question to ask is, can we embed payloads in pixels that are less likely to be transformed? And that's a pretty interesting question because like, if you can do that with a relatively high level of confidence, then just put your payload there uh, and then it won't be affected by all of these, all of these uh, mutations, right? So, 
Stagnography Reloaded is this stuff that was presented at DEF CON this year and blew my mind because what they did was to upload a bunch of images to Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, Slack, Tumblr, Google Plus for some reason. Then um, what, they, what they found was to try to classify, try to detect when a particular pixel was, was, was mutated in any way. And they found that uh, they were able to create a pretty accurate model of predicting how likely a pixel and a particular position is to be mutated, and a particular image is to be mutated, and then they would use this to augment this technography framework and insert the payload in places that are not going to be changed, right? And obviously they use information about how these mutations are done, how likely is it, like if you have a very information rich area of, of a picture, then it's less likely that the compression will try to mess with this area and, and um, that, that's, uh, that was just like really fascinating to me because then you can hide a bunch of stuff in you know, uh, benign looking images that would survive any of these mutations. So what I'm currently working on is influence, influencing user security. I think no one's going to deny that uh, the weakest link in any computer system is the human. And uh, humans are not like computers. We make decisions not based on uh, instructions that we're given, but based on our emotions and passion and how and our motivations that, that we're doing this thing for. So I think users are always going to be the weakest link. And if we can influence how users interact with, with uh, computer systems, then I feel like a lot of downstream security problems will be solved. So 60% um, of breaches or 55% of, of, of incidents are caused by the user not taking proper steps to, to interact with technology or to secure their own uh, systems. Um, and most people don't really consider the longer term consequences of, of their actions. Like, I do things that may be sketchy in terms of like security sometimes. I paste stuff in an online JSON linter because I think that how likely is it that this stuff will actually be read by someone else? Uh, but if you think about it, it's not actually safe. <laughs> and um, especially if that piece of JSON contains like it's a config file that contains keys in there. So I think uh, if everyone thinks in this way that they think that their small action will, has a very small likelihood of actually causing a breach, then the attack vector is actually pretty large. Um, so uh, humans can always get, get around blocking policies. If my company uh, disallowed me from using Dropbox at work, I would uh, better it to a different network if they're using a proxy blocker or I would use it on my phone and then airdrop it to my phone. And I can do all, all, sorts, all sorts of stuff to get around hard blocking policies, right? So I think um, this is stuff that uh, is interesting to me because no one has really tackled it head on before. So that's what I want to be working on in the next few years. Um, and uh, yep. So that, that, that's all for my talk. Uh, I think I kind of designed it such that there's more room for questions after. So thank you. A, a thing that was new to new to me that I hadn't hadn't considered was the <laughs> the the attack vector, like the basically the um, um, the social engineering attack vector, but automated, right? So like I'm gonna like it, it's like a chatbot, except it's trying to fool you know your grandparents into. Giving up the passwords, right? Which is which is frightening. Um, are there? So you mentioned like one example of that. Like, do, have you have you seen have have you seen any of those in the wild yet, or is that still uh, is that still pretty theoretical? Yeah. So I think generally things that appear in DevCon show up in the wild a while later, <laughs> especially since you know you can have public patching for Android devices, right? But how many Android devices actually get patched to the latest versions. So you see like stage fright from a couple of years ago, um, 80 plus percent of devices today are still vulnerable to stage fright's media library vulnerability. And I feel like a lot of these things, it's hard to really tell what they're using to generate their, their, their payload. And it's hard to really tell when something is, um, is uh, generated using these techniques or not. I think something interesting that, um, or something that I think is interesting that I worked on in the past was a Tor chat. So there's chat protocols that go over the, 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 the Tor network. And 
obviously people that do this are not doing this to chat for fun. They're doing this to chat uh, about nefarious things or about things that are illegal. So I think uh, there's this hackathon held by Ashton Kutcher's um, nonprofit. <laughs> um, he runs a nonprofit. Uh, actually, I forgot the name off the top of my head, but it's a, it's against child sexual exploitation. So um, we built something to basically man in the middle chats and to act as a proxy between uh, two people who are chatting about stuff and then trying to determine if they're talking about something that is, uh, you know, not good. And then we would try to find out where they were. If and it, that well, that was the idea behind it, but we actually didn't get to build it in the hackathon. The idea behind it was to build something that would make them give up their locations or make them meet in a certain place um, uh, with a higher probability. So, yeah. There's, you know, a lot of companies are getting hacked, right? Data get leaked all the time. Like HBO just got hacked recently. Uh, do you have any, have you seen any folks who are looking at that data that's being leaked out and doing like analysis or machine learning or not on that data? Second question is, um, have you seen anything around uh, cybersecurity insurance? Like today you talk a lot about kind of AI on the attacker's point of view, right? So I think some, a, lot, a lot of these techniques can be used to uh, uh, test, you know, a system or a company's defense. Like perhaps some of that can be used in terms of pricing, cybersecurity, like that premium, you know? So anything around that. Definitely. So to your first question, th there are definitely people that are doing analysis on breach data. I think in particular, a very common vector is to look at people's credentials because after the stuff is breached, for example, in like LinkedIn breach or Adobe breach, then there would be a bunch of usernames and passwords easily unsalted with rainbow tables and then you would be able to look at the kinds of passwords that people use. So there's this, pass there's this online service called haveibeenpwned.com run, run by, by Troy Hunt, who's uh, doing this full time now, I believe. And what this is, is basically you like insert your email address in there or like a regex that matches your email address. Now it's able to tell you like which breaches contain your email address. Um, more likely than not, you're in there. So uh, I think this is one very useful service and obviously it's, it's, a mean, it's, 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 a, it's something that is meaningful to know about because if you know that your credentials have been breached, then you should change your password if you haven't changed in a while. Or companies that run services, companies that provide authentication portals, if they see that a lot of their users have been breached before, then maybe they should do something to reset their passwords, with, like do it active, proactively. Um, the second question is on insurance. I think, well, I, I, I don't know of any company using AI to really um, model the risk of something, but more and more there are security companies, security vendors that provide security solutions to customers do have, have like guarantees. So for example, if it's a phishing company, I know of one that if you buy us, if you use us, put us in line, if you get breached by a fish, we will give you a million dollars, right? So this is stuff that uh, people are doing to convince people that they're will, really willing to put their money behind their product. Um, and I think more and more this is going to be a case. There's whole conferences on this. Like I think at Stanford every year by the law school, there's a conference on, on cyber insurance and how to really model this risk legally and technically. Um, it's a really interesting area, but I just think like not enough work is being done in this area, especially uh, in terms of the attention that the AI community is giving to it. Because I think that there's lots of attention being given to like financial insurance or real world insurance, but security insurance is still a really new field that not many people are giving attention to. Uh, the main field I'm working is healthcare, and so a lot of what you see around this is trying to access records or anomalous access of records. How, how do you think about the human side? Because part of it, to your point, is the training data of sitting there and watching which records people are accessing, um, or like the types of data people are accessing. For you, like when did, when do you think those will be universally like you're just constantly being tracked of what you're doing in the enterprise, and then automatically stopping attacks like that? Because you see it all the time where someone just, you know, downloads to a thumb drive when they're not supposed to and then leaves the thumb drive out in a hospital parking lot and then, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of records are 
uh, you know, taken. I mean, so for those, like, that's like the extreme edge of really stupid human actions. Yeah. So the serious is like, but those are like, like, like those seem to me like, how, like, what is the gap between like, like the far edge and like then stopping attacks like this? Yeah, I think that that's that's uh, absolutely an area that has been receiving attention lately, but not enough again, because so I think the health industry is really interesting because because of the nature of you know, the consequences of doing something wrong in the health industry, a lot of the devices that they use are old and antiquated, but well-tested. And it doesn't really fit in well with a proper security validation model, because if you find a vulnerability, you're going to patch it. And you shouldn't do this, and no one should ever do this, but if a malicious person took a network packet sniffer and brought it to any hospital today, they'll be able to see packets transferred in the clear and just trivially get past, uh, uh, patient data. And this is because like a lot of this stuff is communicated wirelessly in hospitals for for, for the same reasons that everything is wireless today. And also, um, they're based off technology that's invented 10, 15 years ago, which have no encryption built into them. Uh, so you're being like sent over SNMP, they're, they're sent over like arcane protocols that basically you cannot meaningfully secure. I think there are some companies that are doing some data analysis on, on this, and a lot of the stuff is low-hanging fruit, like things that you can just like flip a switch or turn on a config to, to, to fix. But a lot of the stuff is impossible to fix unless you have low-level integration into these medical devices, which I think is pretty hard. Uh, I think you brought up a good point. Like, How soon will it be till um, we have AI or some kind of analysis engine that will be sitting between your actions and the computer's execution um, to really tell you when something's going wrong? I think like, that's what I'm trying to work on. So. Um, there obviously are also many people trying to tackle this problem from different angles, but I feel like that has to come soon. I think a lot of AI is predicting human behavior or predicting human output, and this is an area that I don't think is that different because um, uh, we are relatively predictable creatures, and our actions are relatively predictable, especially when we're dealing with static systems. So. A lot of this can be solved. Uh, at least, at least, a lot of the low-hanging fruit can be uh, caught, and uh, you can remediate these relatively simply. Do you view it? Just one quick follow-up. Do you view it more as a technical challenge or as a humans accepting being constantly watched challenge? Yeah, I think it's both. So, for example, if your if your company installed a a watchdog on your on your laptop, right? And it was looking at everything you were doing, including stuff that you were doing uh, that are that's private. For example, logging to your personal Facebook account at work, which is maybe not the best thing to do, but a lot of people do it. Um, and it's able to see like what you're doing in a personal Facebook account and what you're chatting about. Uh, is that acceptable? I think to a lot of people it's not. And I think you really have to develop a new trust model around it. And this is really a time to, to do it because like we're trusting more, entrusting more and more of our lives to intelligent assistants, Alexa, Google Home. Like these are all like old examples, but I think trust models between humans and intelligent assistants are things that have to be hashed out sooner or later. And I think this is a time that is, uh, I mean, it, it's it's ripe to talk about this. And I think if we can develop a trust model that this assistant works for me and only for me, and it's not going to reveal anything to my employer unless. I explicitly allow it to, and if we can come up with technical guarantees around it, that'll be great. But if not, then I think a social guarantee will have to work for now. Are there sort of models for working with users that work that like or that seem to work well that are not kind of based on like hard blocking, like sort of like advisory security models that seem to work well? Because I know that you know, like for example, Chrome seems to have gone, you know, or web browsers in general seem to have gone from, you know, saying like, oh, hey, this website, like, this website seems to be bad. Maybe you shouldn't go here to like, actually, I'm going to try really hard to hide the link that you even need to follow to go here. Um, but it seems like there's, you know, like as, um, you know, certainly as attacks become more sophisticated, it seems to like maybe make more sense to, it seems like you may want to get into areas where you're not actually going to even be sure if the thing's malicious or not. Like, hey, this URL looks kind of weird, but you know, it, like if you have other reasons to like believe that it's fine, like, you know, maybe it actually is, I don't really know. 
Like, are there like models that seem to work for communicating this kind of information to people, or is it pretty much just like people like that's all going to turn so noisy that it just gets shoved into the background? Yeah, I think in the past ten years, like if you have used antivirus in the nineteen nineties, you'll see that things pop up all the time and it's super annoying, and you just start to ignore it after a while, um, especially if it has such such a high false positive rate. And so, in recent years, security companies have gone with this mantra of never notifying the user, which I think is okay, which, which I think is, 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 is good in a certain way. For example, like if you have network proxies, they'll just never inform you. They'll, they'll never have a pop-up to ask you for confirmation because if you involve user decision in, in, in the loop, then the more likely they're not going to make a bad decision and going to negatively influence their behavior in the future. So I think there have been very, very few examples of um, successfully influence, influencing a user in, in models that have uh, that involve their decision making. Uh, I think that can change. I feel, I kind of like a security nihilist. I feel like the user security is never going to be solved. We're never going to be, we're never going to have the whole human population or everybody interacting with tech, get them to understand about security risks in a way that they will never be breached ever again. Um, that's just unrealistic, right? But I feel like it's possible to at least raise the bar high enough such that people actually have to put in enough work to get past this. I think the, the iOS jailbreaking community is, is an interesting example of this because Apple kind of raised the bar so high that the only people who are able to afford vulnerabilities are nation states. And I think that's when we've succeeded because if you, you know, rely on a GDP to really purchase an iOS exploit, then you really have to really want to hack this guy. And I feel like if someone is that motivated, nothing can really stop it. So, yeah. I mean the yeah, I think defending is always harder, just because you're dealing with the entire surface versus looking for a hole in the surface. Um, so fundamentally, I think it'll actually help the attacking side better. But the thing about security is that a lot of defense relies on offense. So if you can find the bugs before someone else can, then uh, you're more likely to be able to fix it before someone else does exploits it. So I feel like it's kind of double-edged and it's not really like a straightforward thing. Um, but definitely defense is going to be hard. I guess as a like example, like you might expect since there are so many user-based attacks, you can imagine a, game, a sort of game where basically the attacker is trying to impersonate a real person and the defender, like the company who's trying to protect me as an individual, is trying to distinguish between me and like something impersonating me. Like that's the game. And maybe the equilibrium, like it seems like maybe the equilibrium is the attacker does a perfect job of impersonating me. Like they scraped my Twitter, everything, and they just know how to look like me, and they can, you know, forge the calls and so forth, and the discriminator can't tell the difference at all. Yeah. So like, I don't know. Does that sound like a reason to be pessimistic, I guess? Or Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Um I mean, it's kinda like reverse Turing tests, so you're trying to figure out if someone's an, you know, a human or, or not, uh, or good or not. So it's always going to be easy to hide your intentions or your identity. So I think uh, it's, you know, you're, you're on point. It's, it's, <laughs> it's funny, it's like, like, to, that, to that point, like I'm, I, I leave this talk far more frightened of progress on the Turing test than I would have ever had. I, I, I sort of dismissed the Turing test as some kind of cute like like application of AI, but 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 you're exactly right. Like there's like, you know, as soon as as soon as my as soon as there's a, a biometrically identical version of myself out there, like that's a huge attack vector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah they don't so. know my passwords though. <laughs> right. right.
Yeah, I think uh, authentication is a, is a huge area. Like we've always relied on um, existing like real time features about ourselves to approach biometric authentication, but that's fundamentally, I think, insecure because it's accessible to anybody around you. Um, some, a, a really interesting talk that I went to at DEF CON, which is totally unrelated to AI, is, is uh, this talk by Intel's chief medical officer. He's basically saying like, the biggest attack vector he thinks that will come in the security space in the world is gonna come from genetics because um, any mischievous or malicious attacker is gonna be able to create um, a virus or, or, or a gene that's able to be, that's able to, in a very targeted way, wipe out, wipe out an entire race. And if you have a software, software vulnerability that causes your iPhones to crash, that's fine. But if people die because of this, then that's, that's not right. The advice he gave was actually to, to not ever give up your, your, your DNA sequence. And never use, like, exactly, so <laughs> someone, someone asked that question, and, and he says like, there's been obviously like, crazy attempts to, to, uh, to try to fix this problem by like, taking backups of your DNA, like screenshots, and, and like restoring it if something bad happens so people never get sick again or people, yeah. But, but um, he's saying like, so if you give up your gene for something good like that, then it's fine. But if you're giving up your genes to um, find out where you came from arbitrarily, then he thinks that that's, that's kind of dumb and you shouldn't do that. Um, but obviously, people are not going to think that way until, unfortunately, something does happen. So, uh, and I think that I left that talk feeling very scared. <laughs> so, things are fairly pessimistic. I, I, I don't feel good for like giving that message out, but I think that people need to start to take note of these things before, uh, before um, everyone else in charge of making big decisions take, take note. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> um, let's thank our speaker. Any questions you guys have uh, can ask uh, in person. Cool. Thank you.